Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Jamie Goodlett, and I am going to let him introduce himself. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Peggy. Thank you so much for uh, having me tonight. I know we've had several communications, and so it's actually nice to, to see your face. Um, for your audience, um, my name is Jamie Goodlett. I hail from Youngstown, Ohio, but I currently live in Columbus. Um, I am technically an apologist, and um, I don't apologize for anything, that's for sure. Um, a, a apologist just means apologia in the Greek, and, and it means to make a defense, like a reason defense. Some people think of it like almost like a courtroom kind of uh, legal defense. And so what I do is I defend the Christian worldview. Uh, and so I'll maybe go on a college campus or uh, like currently I have a podcast with an atheist. I co-host this uh, podcast, the God or Not podcast, and we'll debate all kinds of issues. You know, nothing is off off limits. And um, so I do things like that. I go into churches and I, I, I talk on all kinds of things, um, evidence for God's existence, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the pro-life, how to defend the pro-life position. I talk about LGBTQIA stuff, transgender stuff. So um, a lot of things are like hot button cultural issues is primarily what I do. And I try to help equip the church to defend uh, their beliefs. Because oftentimes you'll have a Christian who uh, they, they know what they believe, but they don't know why necessarily they believe it. You know, maybe they were born and raised in church, or maybe they had an experience when they were a student or a kid, and then that kind of brought them into um, the church. But they're not really sure why they're Christian, and they, it's sometimes very hard for them to articulate why it is they're a Christian. And so that's primarily what I do, is I, I help people um, um, build their faith that Christianity is true. I help answer questions surrounding, you know, all kinds of objections that, that people might pose. And um, that's what I, I, I primarily do. But before I was an apologist, I was a fireman. I worked as a fireman with the city of Youngstown uh, for a, a long time. I was there for a long time. And then God called me into the ministry and through some uh, through some circumstances, some beyond my control, uh, I ended up in Columbus, Ohio, as an associate pastor at a Pentecostal church, primarily dealing with students. And then after about four or five years, I felt God calling me into this, this world of apologetics, and that's where I'm at now. Okay. You go right ahead. Oh, terrific. So uh, I'm, I, of course, I'm here in, in Columbus, Ohio. I'm married. I have two kids. And um, I've been, I was turned on to near death experiences. I've never had one. Uh, and dare I say, I want one because I'm not sure that I do. Uh, I, I would love to have the near death experience uh, minus the near death part. Because uh, uh, I am envious uh, of, of some of the experiences that people have had. But I, I was turned on to near-death experiences through a, a man named Gary Habermas, and he is a, a Christian apologist. He's from Liberty University, and he is a, um, prolific in the uh, near-death community. I think he is um, editor at one of, or the, maybe the only peer-reviewed near-death experience um, journal that's out there. And um, I became friends with Dr. Habermas, and he kind of put me on to this thing called near-death experiences. And so it was probably over the course of maybe um, three, four, or five years that I began developing kind of an argument for God's existence based upon near-death experiences. And uh, in particular, I was interested in those near-death experiences that were evidential in nature. So uh, I've probably listened to several thousand uh, or read several thousand near-death experiences. So I'm, I'm as familiar as I think as I can be with the, um, the, the related literature. And what I found is that there were a lot of near-death experiences that were very subjective. Of course, they're, they're coming from uh, a person from the inside. They're trying to relay an experience that they had. 
But I found that there were some that had certain kind of corroborating evidence, some verifiable evidence that we could actually go and check up on these things. And the community that I deal with, the skeptical community that I deal with, uh, th that's what they're all about. They they want that you know they they want it in a beaker. You know they they, they want they want to see it. They want to be able to test it. Sometimes it's difficult because God, being an immaterial being, uh, is 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 hard to put in a test tube. Well, it's just uh, that's uh, not a scientific endeavor as much as it is a philosophical one. But there are still all kinds of um, still all kinds of things that we can find within the philosophical community that relate to science. And so we see all kinds of arguments from God's existence coming out of the hard sciences like um, the DNA, um, kind of the, uh, the idea that, um, you know, God's signature is, is wrapped up in the information contained in DNA. Uh, and from cosmology, we see all kinds of arguments for God's existence from the beginning of the universe or the fine tuning of the universe, things like that. And near-death experiences kind of uh, caught my ear uh, partially because I think it is a field in which there, there's not a lot going on in terms of it's one of the most underdeveloped fields uh, within, uh, within my discipline of apologetics. So when someone does apologetics, oftentimes they'll have one primary thing that they work in. So uh, Hugh Ross, he's a Christian, he's a cosmologist. And so he primarily deals with cosmology. And um, there are other people like uh, Dr. Bill Craig. Uh, he is a philosopher and a theologian. So he dabbles in, in those areas primarily. But there aren't a whole lot of Christian apologists dabbling in near death experiences. And so I thought that this would be um, kind of a good way that possibly I could help the, uh, the, the, the church, the church uh, as a whole by providing some evidence from these near-death experiences. Um, now there's the, primarily the ones I'm looking for with these near-death experiences are the ones that somehow we can corroborate, like I had mentioned before. And we know that through straight logic and reason that we all can't be right. We just can't, it's just impossible. So uh, either there is a God or there isn't. There can't be both. There can't be a God for you and not for me. That's not how truth works. There either is or isn't. So if atheism or naturalism is false, okay, then that means there, there has to be a God at that point, right? So we're, we're just using pure logic and reason to try to, uh, uh, to, try to narrow down the field. So we know we all can't be, tr uh, can't, can't be right, but we also know that someone has to be right. I mean, we can't all be completely wrong. I mean, like, like I said, I just gave you a dichotomy. Either there is a God or there isn't, right? I mean, there, there is, like, I can't think of a third option there. So it is a, a true dichotomy where there's only two options. And so oftentimes what I like to do is take these near-death experiences and use them to, to, to narrow things down. Um, I know there are quite a few near-death experiences that specifically talk about things like Jesus uh, they meet Jesus, or they they have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, or God the Father. Somehow, um, they talk about heaven, and they talk about things that are our Christian worldview. Um, but a lot of them don't talk about that at all. I mean, you know that these things are not monolithic; they're not all the same. People have very different experiences. And uh, so while some pe person might interpret the light as being Jesus, someone might interpret that light as being some kind of force or energy, but they both can't be right. Not, not, not in, in the hard sense. It's, it's, either, it's either Jesus or it's something else, but it, it can't be both. Um, but I don't necessarily make the case as much for Christianity as I make the case for theism. So for um, your, uh, I mean, your audience is, is pretty intelligent. I've been 
I've been working my way through your videos and, and talking with people. Uh, they're not slouches. They, they uh, and I'm sure they have to be because I know many of them have been attacked, uh, unfortunately, for their beliefs. And unfortunately, in the church, which is, um, which is something the church has to do better. But uh, a theism is just belief in God, belief that there is a God, as opposed to atheism, the belief that there is no God, or many atheists nowadays like to say they just lack belief in God. They just say, I'm, I'm unconvinced. Um, but I think that we can take these near-death experiences, these evidential ones, and we can narrow down to at least theism, the idea that there is a God. And then from there, if I can get someone to agree with me on that, oh, then it's a cakewalk to Christianity. Because then I trot out evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, which is really very, very powerful from a theological and historical perspective. So I like to take these uh, near-death experiences, um, primarily the evidential ones, and I'll give you a couple here in a minute, and I'm sure you're familiar with these. Um, but there's probably in the scholarly literature, probably about three or 400 that are considered like evidential, verifiable, corroborated kind of NEDs. And these are the ones I'm most interested in. I, li I love listening to these. I mean, I really do enjoy hearing people's stories, especially when they come from obviously a, a Christian worldview, but uh, I enjoy them nonetheless. But it's these ones that have the kind of the evidential backing. These are the ones that have bite kind of in my community. I'm not just bark. I'm not just saying, hey, look at this experience someone had. Uh, I'm saying, hey, look at this experience someone had, and here's how we know they had it, right? So that, that is like the, the, the key. And then the difficult thing for the naturalist, right, someone who is or believes that nature is all there is, is, is how do they round that square peg? You know, how, how do they, um, how can they maintain their naturalism if there's something outside of nature, right? It seems to me you have to kind of abandon that, that naturalism at that point. Um, and so some of these cases actually are, are, are quite uh, evidential. You've heard, obviously, the most iconic is Maria Shu. You've heard the one about Maria Shu. Um, Maria being an immigrant worker um, uh, in the, um, in the emergency room, having, um, um, a near death experience, uh, saying, Hey, listen, I had this experience. I went outside my body. I went outside the hospital. Oh, and by the way, there's a shoe on one of these ledges on the third floor here. And there's a, a the, the shoelace is tucked underneath the heel and it's a blue men's shoe. And there's a worn spot right where the small toe is. Um, yeah, go find it. Right. And so in that particular case, the uh, the caseworker uh, 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 went and found the shoe and there it was. And this was done in full view of other people. As a matter of fact, she said that they basically left it there as a shrine, almost like the Shroud of Turin for a couple of weeks. And people were coming and looking, like, oh, that's the shoe. The one the one lady said she saw, you know. So um, that is. I heard evidential. somebody say that was debunked because they could not produce the witness, the person that actually went and retrieved the shoe. No, as a matter of fact, um, I just heard an interview the other day. Um, the, the woman who retrieved the shoe, her name is Kimberly Clark Smith, and she still has the shoe. It's in her garage. Like the problem with these people who say they've debunked things is oftentimes. Um, they go, they don't go into it with an open mind. They go into it looking to debunk it. And so oftentimes the evidence is uh, skewed in a way that, um, that would benefit them because that's what they're looking for. So for instance, in the case of Maria Shu, um, one person says, oh, well, you can see that from the sidewalk. So she would have known about it. Well, I've got a couple of problems with that. The first being... If you go back to when that happened in 1977, there was no sidewalk there. It was like a non-walking area of the hospital. Nobody walked there. It was like the, this part of the hospital, there's just grass. People just don't go walking there. Also, Maria was from out of town. She was visiting people. This is the first time in the city. 
And then lastly, what, 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 like, what she makes this up? Like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fake a really severe medical condition, somehow fake out all the doctors and nurses, and then claim to have this near death experience and tell them about this shoe. Um, that's what they call ad hoc thinking, which means you're kind of making things up as you go along to try to make the evidence fit into what you want. And so uh, that wasn't the, debun- anytime you hear somebody say something is debunked, you probably should look a little further into it because it probably isn't. Even when a Christian says something is debunked, um, I, I don't know if something's been argued about, like you hear all the time, oh, the cosmological arguments for God's existence, they've all been debunked. Really? So who exactly debunked this? Because we've had theologians and philosophers and cosmologists saying these kinds of things for millennia. And, and now you, a YouTuber, you come along and you debunk, like, all right, come on. But this was not debunked. Uh, somebody tried to put out a paper, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a, a scholarly uh, bit of work. It was just a couple of college students that, that um, put, put this together under kind of under false pretense. But that's not the only one. See, if you just had one, then, then, then maybe I would take the skeptics argument a, a little more seriously. But, but what we find is um, just a whole shoebox full of really good evidential near-death experiences that um, you really have to go and jump through hoops to, to get around these, right? So let me give you another one. Um, you heard of the one where the psychiatrist um, got some spaghetti sauce on his tie. Yeah. And then, of course, he wanted to, uh, you know, he was he was going to go in and interview a girl that just overdosed on some medication. And so he, he he put on a lab coat because he didn't have time to change and he didn't want to go in there with a bunch of stuff all over his tie. And so he put a buttoned up the lab coat all the way. He went in and she was still unconscious from the, you know, from from having her full arrest. And so he decided, well, she's not here, but I could go talk to her friend. Maybe I can get a head start on tomorrow and I can get her friend's kind of description of the events and how things went down. And then tomorrow I'll talk to this, this girl, Holly. So he went down the hallway and basically to another part of the hospital and talked to Holly's best friend about this overdose. You know, what were the circumstances surrounding this? You know, what, what do you think Holly, you know, what was her state of mind when this happened? Has she been going through all, you know, has she been going through stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, after interviewing her, both she and he left for the day and Holly is still unconscious in her, in her journey there in the room. The next day, the very first patient is, is Holly. So he goes in, he leans down. She's still just now kind of coming out of, um, out of this state. And uh, he says, hi, Holly, I'm Dr. Um, what was it? Dr. Dr. Grayson, I think it was, you know, and um um, you know, I'm here to talk to you. And she goes, oh, I remember you from the, uh, from last night. And he said, oh, I, I, I thought you, I put my head in here, but I thought you were unconscious. She goes, oh, no, 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 not from that. When you were talking to my friend, Sarah. And then she went on. Now, this is a, uh, a psychiatrist for a hospital who also at the time considered himself an extreme skeptic. Um, he never came out and said he was an atheist, but uh, that's my assumption. He said that she went into great detail, not only about what she said, but what he said. And she mentioned, oh, yeah, you were wearing that striped tie, the one with the red stain on it. And he's like, how on earth? So he spent the next week trying to debunk it himself. Like, this can't be the case. He said his initial feeling was that of terror, like Oh my gosh, like my worldview is starting to crumble. And, and, and so that's one of these evidential near-death experiences where somebody has information that they should not have. And they gain this information at a time when they shouldn't be able to gain any information at all. So when you're in a state of clinical, of course, you know this, when you're in a state of clinical death, you're not have, you have no heartbeat, right? And you have no brain and no measurable brain activity. And during that time, you should have no thoughts, no dreams, no hallucinations, nothing. You're out, kaput, lights out, nothing. 
But yet she came back having had experience during that time when she should have had none. And she came back with information that she couldn't possibly have had. And we see case after case after case that are similar in this evidential way. Uh, you've probably heard of the, the, the you know, their blind near-death experience where, where they see. Yeah. They've been blind since birth. Uh, there's one that recently came out. Uh, I don't know how old it is, but it, it, was, it was a man who was blind from birth and he was having some kind of procedure done and he flatlined, you paid clinical death. And he said he went out of his body and he could see. And he gave a very detailed report of what was in the room. Now, if I'm being super skeptical, I could say, well, yeah, maybe. But, you know, just because he's blind doesn't mean he was dumb. I mean, he's probably listened to things before. He probably has an idea of maybe how a, a room like that would be set up. But he also came up with more information. He said, hey, oh, yeah, by the way, down the hall, there was a guy in you know, once I left my body, I kind of drifted down the hall through the walls into this, you know, a few rooms over. And there's a guy having his leg amputated. Now, now it's not like having a bypass where, you know, bypasses happen all the time. You know, it's, it's not that, it's not that common to have your leg amputated. And so for this guy to have information again, that he, he, he shouldn't be able to have, he's very specific about where people were, what they were doing, and specifically giving information about the amputee. Um, to me, that's information he shouldn't have, and he claims to have gotten it. And the only time he could have gotten this information is if it happened when he was uh, in, that, in that full arrest state, in that clinical death, because he, it wasn't like he was taking a tour of the hospital before and could have saw it and then dropped over. And, you know, nothing like that is going on here. And so we see case after case after case that they're evidential in nature and they're corroborating. And um, I've had a few people say, well, but that doesn't mean God exists. Okay, fair enough. But that means your worldview is wrong. So I'll take that. Like, I'll take that. It means atheism or naturalism is false. And at least the supernatural exists. I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm Because at that point, if you grant the supernatural exists, it's a fairly easy jump from that to the Christian worldview or from that to theism. It's it's a super easy jump. There are 90% of the way there. Yeah, and proves so, lights are out. Right. Yep. Yep. So that that is that is um basically um what I do as it pertains to near uh near death experiences. Now do you go into churches and talk about this or you just do your podcast? No, I, I actually, that's one of my favorite things to do. I love going into churches. Um, uh, I, I've been, I've been all over the state, um, even out of state. And um, there are, like I said, there are several things that I'm competent uh, on. I want to make sure that, um, that when I speak on something that I, I am able to speak with some authority and so the, the topics that I'm, I'm currently speaking on when I go into churches are, of course, um, evidence for God's existence, evidence for the historical Jesus and his resurrection, um, uh, uh, the pro-life case and how to defend it. That's been pretty hot recently. Um, LGBTQ, transgender issues. Uh, and of course, near death experiences. And so there's a handful, probably between a half dozen to a dozen topics that I'm qualified to speak on. And so, um, yeah, I do the podcast, but then also my, kind of my bread and butter. Um, and what I ultimately really like to do is equip the believer. I, I used to think that apologetics was 80% for the skeptic and 20% for the Christian. And since being in apologetics, it's kind of flip-flop for me. And, and now I've seen uh, that some of the skeptics are a little more hard-headed, <laughs> a little more difficult to convince, whereas I'm seeing a lot of fruit come from Christians who grew up in the church, who are very well-meaning, uh, well-educated, terrific people who just have no idea why they're a Christian. And 
when they realize that there's really that we actually have like evidence, like, you know, we don't just cross our fingers and, 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 and really, really hope, you know, this idea that faith is somehow blind. That's not biblical. It's taught nowhere in scripture. Faith just means trust. I'm trusting in something I have good reason to believe is true. Um, and when people experience that, it's truly a blessing for me to see um, uh, kind of the sparkle in the eye and, and, and the idea that, oh, I really don't have to have this kind of blind faith, but I can trust in um, evidence. I can provide evidence for people. I could show people, look, hey, look, this, we could, we, we could test this in a beaker. <laughs> look, I can, I can show you the tests. I can, uh, I can point to cosmology or biology or history uh, or any of these disciplines. And that's the nice thing about Christianity is that we don't just have a mountain of evidence, but the evidence um, runs a broad spectrum of human experience. So it's not just like we have evidence in, in a kind of our theology, but we can go to every discipline in life and find evidence there. So I tell people all the time, whatever you love, you can find an argument for God's existence. So there are, there's arguments from beauty. The fact that, that we can look out and see a sunset and know that it's objectively beautiful is there's an argument for God's existence there. We can look at ethics and we could say, you know what? There are some things that are just always, it's always wrong to torture a baby for fun. And because we know that, I can show you how it follows that God exists from that, um, from history and biology and cosmology and just any subject matter that you can think of, there's an argument for God's existence that is kind of wrapped up in that. How do um, the Christians that are non-believers of NDEs, um, what do they say? Like why they don't believe or is it from something from the Bible that they quote? Yeah, there's a, a few verses in the in the Bible that they quote, and I, I you know, I, well, I've told people this, and sometimes um, the NDE, my NDE friends, have an knee-jerk reaction when I say there's nothing in the Bible about near-death experiences. We see visions, we see dreams, we see people dying and coming back, but in my narrow definition of near-death experience, there has to be someone saying, "Hey, I experienced something when I was dead." Right. So Lazarus oftentimes, gives, well, what about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Well, yeah, he did. Um, but but Lazarus was dead, dead. And he didn't come back and say he saw something, although I'm sure he did. Uh, it'd be nice to have his testimony. Um, but just because it's not explicitly taught in the Bible doesn't mean it's not implied. For instance, um, did you know that felony home invasion is not taught in the Bible. So I guess we can just go break into people's homes and steal whatever we want. People will say, well, nah, but, but stealing, but it, you can't steal, right? You can't steal, but it doesn't say anything about felony home invasion. Felony home invasion is implied because it says thou shalt not steal. And as a Christian, we can imply that these near death experiences are um, not only are they, um, um, like accurate with the Christian worldview, but it's what we should expect because we are what, what we call substance dualists, which means we believe that uh, the substance, what we are, is made up two things. Most Christians do. Uh, that it's made up the physical. Obviously, the Apostle Paul talks about, you know, this tent, right? Uh, so it's made up the physical, but there's also a, a spiritual component. So C.S. Lewis often said, Listen, we're not a body. We are a soul that happens to be in a body. Uh, the Trinity isn't taught anywhere or isn't said anywhere in Scripture, but it's implied everywhere. So just because it doesn't say so-and-so had a near-death experience doesn't mean that, okay, now th those are all of a sudden of the devil. And oftentimes it's what I get um, when, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of people who are open to near near death experiences, particularly as how I'm able to present and caveat it. I don't know why. I don't know if it's uh, how I do or what I present. But the ones I find that give me the most pushback 
tend to be more fundamentalist. And so they're a little bit more hard-lined. They take the Bible extremely literally. And, um, and you know, they say, Jamie, don't you take the Bible literally? Well, yeah, when it's meant to be taken literally. But I read in the book of Revelation about a seven-headed dragon coming out of the sea. I don't really think a seven-headed dragon is coming out of the sea. But I don't think the Bible's false. That must just not be literal, right? It's apocalyptic literature. And so there, there is some pushback. But I, I find that it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe God is, is helping me with this, um, uh, soften people's hearts, but oftentimes in the way I present it. Um, because many times what people have heard in the Christian community about near-death experiences, they typically aren't hearing ones with a Christian persuasion. Right. They're hearing a lot of things about a force and, and some higher power and that screams of like new age. And so that freaks them out. They're like, Oh, new age is false. And, you know, and they can't sometimes can't wrap their mind around the idea that listen, near death experiences can be true. Even if some of them are false, even if some of them are made up, just somebody just straight up lied about it. Even if some of them are demonic, even if some of them are, um, um, caused by electrical stimuli in the brain as it's shutting down, even if some are caused by certain kinds of medications like opioids at near, you know, in hospice, near, near uh, end of life things, even if some of it is caused by um, um, hypoxia, lack of oxygen to the brain, even, yes, do we have those? Yes, I'm sure many near-death experiences were just hallucinations. I think I'm sure, some near-death experiences are legit, but they get tainted when the near-death experiencer goes to a new age group. It, oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that, so, so it, it, it is, uh, unless it's evidential in nature, and that's why I love the evidential ones so much, unless it's evidential in nature, I can't speak on the um, legitimacy of it. But I, I try to tell my Christian brothers and sisters, like, listen, all truth is God's truth. If, if I'm going to learn calculus, I'm not turning to the book of Leviticus. If, if I want to learn to juggle or fix my van, I'm not going to the Bible for it. But yet I'm finding that I can learn how to juggle and I'm finding that I can fix my van and I'm finding that I can do calculus. Like there are truths out there that aren't tucked into the Bible somewhere, but that doesn't make them not true. And as, as Christians, um, now I consider myself a very, very theologically conservative Pentecostal. I would even call myself an evangelical fundamentalist, which is crazy bad word in our culture today. And even having um, kind of that um, niche of denomination or even being in that part of our worldview, I say, listen, there is truth everywhere. Someone might have a near-death experience and just misinterpret. Like they were Hindu all their life. They don't know nothing about Jesus. So when they see this bright light, they're going to call it the force. What, what else do you want them to do? Like people are seeing this through the lens of their experience and their worldview. And so, um, and like I said, it, Oftentimes I tell uh, people that, look, the difference in some of these is that some of these things in the Bible where, you know, um, appointed uh, wants a, a person to die and then the judgment um, or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And they'll say stuff like, well, some of these NEDs, they got, you know, they're, they're all over the place and they're, you know, they're not present with the Lord. And I said, well, they didn't die. That is talking about death. They had a near death experience, which is different than dead, dead, biological dead. And so we have to be very careful. Why could I know probably a half dozen, just myself, of people who have had near death experiences who've come to Christ afterwards. So why is it that God couldn't give someone a near death experience, uh, this experience, to bring them to Christ. 
why why couldn't God do that? Why 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 are you saying this is not possible? And so I tried to um, relate to some of these skeptics, even within the Christian, uh, even within the church. I tried to relate to them um, in a way saying, hey, listen, yeah, your criticisms can be true and near-death experiences still be true. And more than likely, it's probably a little of both. We probably do have some of these because someone was hypoxic or because someone had way too much morphine or whatever. But there are some that cannot be brushed away, that cannot be set aside, that are so legitimate and so evidentially based that you would have to close your eyes and put your fingers in your ears and ignore the evidence uh, in order to continue their line of thinking. So while I do see some pushback, I'm excited about um, people being open to these near-death experiences. And what I hope to do, um, not just within my ministry, but within this particular niche of the ministry with the near-death experiences, is I I want to help people who have had near-death experiences, uh, maybe help interpret, help them interpret it a little bit. Um, It would be very difficult for me to speak into something not having had the experience myself, but I think I can help them think about it correctly. And even if I don't, I think it's important that we listen to people and validate that, hey, um, I might not believe your experience, but I believe you believe your experience. And so I'm not someone who is a relativist who believes that, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. No, no, there's truth out there. We may not know it. Uh, there, there might be a certain part of the truth that might be shaded in gray where we can't delineate between what exactly is true and what isn't. But there is two plus two is four, right? There is some truth out there. Even if I don't think two plus two is four, I'm just wrong. And so... I want to help uh, Christians and the church and people who have experienced near death, um, having these near death experiences. I I want to try to bridge that gap somehow the best I can and and to help them see this, um, not just from a a biblical worldview, but from a common sense worldview. Like, man, we we can't interpret everything through the lens of scripture. Oh, I know some Christians are probably going to throw a shoe at at the computer when I say that. I don't mean that maybe in the way some people think. I think scripture is the ultimate authority. And if anything contradicts it, scripture always wins. But in the areas where scripture is silent or vague or uncertain, I think we should be charitable with our Christian brothers and sisters. And that's why I think reaching out to some of these people who have had near-death experiences is important because they need to see someone in the church who's going to be charitable towards the experience that they had, who's going to listen and be attentive, who's going to affirm that, yeah, you really did have an experience, and that's going to help try to make sense of it with them, if I can. Have you thought about having like a study group of, and say, take a couple near-death experiences and watch it on a video, have everybody in a group watch it, and then take notes, somebody would be in charge, you know, taking notes of their thoughts about it, and then challenge those thoughts and to um, critical thinking and investigative techniques, you know, what would be the questions you would ask that near-death experiencer, or what don't you believe in it, what do you find that is not true, and, and they could bounce off each other and, and you throw out ideas because we're all sitting in judgment of these people and deciding whether they're telling the truth or not. And none of us are really equipped to do that. But there is some some questions you can ask and some critical thinking. Like on my show, I'm not going to you know, challenge people and, you know, I may ask, you know, some questions and let it go. But, you know, I'm not going to be like <clears throat> like I used to be an investigator. You know, I'm not going like, to try to find a determination. Yes or no. Are you the telling the truth? That's not my job. But um It just sounds to me like people aren't aware of how to do critical thinking when they're just throwing out these things 
and not really studying um, what actually they're saying. Like, the, it's not just a uh, something they couldn't have seen otherwise that they're seeing. There's also other evidence like um, a lot of these near-death experiencers are actually dead. I mean, not just close to death, but dead. Or they're so close to death, like they're already having them write out their will or they're making their funeral arrangements and they're giving them a 3% chance, 5%, whatever. But they have their near-death experience. They come back and so many of those break all those odds. They're suddenly healed. It's a miracle. And doctors right. will say, it's a miracle. And to me, that's evidence. Absolutely. That, that would be considered part of an evidential NDE. Um, so also a changed life, I also consider as evidence right. as well. Although some of these, you know, we weigh evidence. So if we, if I had a smoking gun, we're going to give probably that a little bit more evidential credibility than if, if I had like Billy Bob sock, you know, you know, so, so there's going to be, we're, we're going to weigh this evidence, but I think you brought up a, a good point that is probably the crux of, of the issue. It is um, kind of dogmatic thinking that is disconnected from logical thinking and critical thinking um, that especially within, I hate to say it, but especially within my particular denomination, a certain denomination of Pentecostal, you know, we're experiential based. And I love that because I am like a super emotional dude. I mean, crying, I cry. I, my wife is like hard as stone and I'm <laughs> over here weeping. Like, I, and so I, I am very much experience based and I love that. The problem is this. Um, and now I don't know how your listeners will will take this, so I'm just going to say it. This is my personality. Uh, I don't think Mormons are Christians. I think some Mormons can be Christians despite their theology. I don't think that um, um, uh, there are other other people like Islam. Islam that, that's obviously that's that's not Christian. But sometimes I'll tell Christians like, if you only base it on experience, so what? Mormons will go to their grave. They'll pass a polygraph stating they had a burning in the bosom or they, they asked God to reveal himself. They read the Book of Mormon or the Doctrines and Covenants or whatever, and they had this burning in the bosom, which they interpret as the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, we would say that they're dead wrong, um, but we you can't say that they're dead wrong and then only bring to the table, well, the Holy Spirit told me so. Well, well, the Holy Spirit told them so too. So, yeah, so you have to bring a little bit more. I, I, I like to say that there is a difference between knowing God is real and showing that God is real. I, I think that we all have what, um, um, what, what the, the older theologians used to call sensus divinitatis, like the sense of the divine. I think most of us have this option or this uh, intuition that, that there is this higher power. So I, I think we can know that without any evidence at all. I think we could just kind of know that there's a God through this, this kind of intuition. But if I want to show someone that there's a God, well, that, that now I can't just provide you with my intuition. I, I have to provide, unless you share that intuition with me, and then that might be more powerful. But, but now I have to bring something more to the table. And as Christians, um, we need to be very critical thinkers. Uh, it's not going to get any easier for us. I mean, and I Christian, think the word Christian is getting to be a bad word because one, we have cruel Christians mm -hmm. and then we have, you know, the judgmental Christians, mm -hmm. which we all judge, even though, right. you know, and, um, and then, of course, the, the liberals are giving the Christians a bad name for political mm -hmm. reasons and whatever. Yep. But um, and so, you know, used to be you'd say someone's a good Christian. That meant something other than what it right. means today, because exactly. it could mean this person is so hard set. They are right. And everybody else is wrong. And they're mm -hmm. going to be so because I get them in my comments. I get cruel Christians. Right, my comments. Right. That's you know, too bad. Yeah, that's the so atheists now or the new agers. Now it's like the cruel Christians. Right. <laughs> using a Bible to bump me, right. hit me over the head with and yeah. tell me why I shouldn't have had this guest. 
I'm like, oh, so you, th- you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, so I should have been mean to this person. Is that what right. you're saying? I should have totally embarrassed them and humiliated yeah. them and called them a liar. And I don't, they're probably telling the truth. You know, I don't know. Right. And somebody could tell the truth and be wrong. Uh, there's a there's a difference between being mistaken and being honestly mistaken and trying to deceive someone. Kelly, come on. I mean, that would mean that everything I say that is wrong, that somehow like I'm wringing my hands. <laughs> I can't wait to deceive people. Like, like, that's ridiculous. Most people, when they're wrong, it's not because they want to be and deceive people. It's because they're honestly mistaken. So people can be wrong and just honestly mistaken. Um and, and um, back to your comment about judging, where you said, yeah, we all judge. We do. And it's not always wrong to judge. The Bible tells us to judge, but the Bible tells us to judge unhypocritically. The Bible says, look, it says, you know, they throw out the verse all the time, judge not lest you be judged. And I say, okay, keep going, right? You can't stop there. That's in the middle of, a, that's not even in the middle. That's not even the end of the, it's in the middle of the verse, right? So judge not lest you be judged. Basically, paraphrased, because the same way you judge, God's going to judge you in that same way. So if you are harsh and super strict, then God is going to be the same uh, towards you. And so it says at the end of that verse or the end of that chapter, it says, so remove the log from your own eye so that you're better prepared or equipped to help your brother remove the log from his. So it's not saying we shouldn't judge, but it. It's saying there's a right way to do this and you can't be a hypocrite when you judge and you can't judge in such a way like uh, one one of uh one of the people that i admire the most in this world his name is phil fernandez he's an apologist and a pastor and he said this which was so common sense but it 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 rung such it's so true with me is is he said every interaction that we have with someone even if it has nothing to do with um, Christianity per se, you're either bringing them one step closer to Jesus or one step further away to Jesus. And I always found that to be very insightful. And obviously when you look at the Bible, the Bible doesn't say we shouldn't uh, call out lies or hypocrisy or that we shouldn't judge what is true or not. The Bible specifically tells us to do that, but it tells us how we should do that. And most people don't do it like that. Most people do it the hypocritical way. Most people do it in such a way that makes you want to punch them in the face. Like, listen, just be nice. It's not that it's not that hard. You can. And you know what? Look, if I am as kind to someone as I can be and I speak the truth in love with the right heart, if they're still upset at me or angry with me, I, there's nothing I could do at, at that point because God calls us to speak the truth. But we have to do it with love and with gentleness and with tact. And there's a way there's a way to do these things, you know. And so I'm always amazed I, when, like, say I had someone in, on and they really lean towards the new age stuff. But there's always one person. Eventually, it might be months and it'll come up a comment that this person, you know, either forgot about their faith or you know, someone died and they were mad at God, or maybe they never had any faith, whatever it was, but that is the one that brought them back to God. Hmm. And I'm thinking that, you know, <laughs> everybody else could have been like, I hate it. I hate it. But for yeah. one person that says, you know, this made me cry, this made me pray and I'm going to start doing better. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's the one they needed to hear. And it may not be for the whole, you know, bunch of people, you know, a thousand views, you know, I mean, a hundred thousand views and everybody praising it. It might be this one that got, you know, a thousand views. Right. Most people didn't want to watch. Oh, they decided in the first five minutes, this is crap. But somebody, it spoke to them and they stuck with it and it got in their heart. And I would, you know, like to speak to any Christian that would say that's wrong. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard because I'm like the biggest lover of the church. And I, I, people often say, well, I love Jesus, not religion. I don't think you could separate the two, but I understand kind of what they're trying to say. I love organized religion. I love it. I love my church. I love how it's structured. I, I think that 
being a part of the body of Christ is a necessity for every believer. Um, but but I, I also am one of the harshest critics of the church as well. So I'm one of the biggest supporters, but also one of the harshest critics. And I think a lot of it has to do, again, like I said, with this very literal wooden interpretation of the Bible. They, they grew up um, in a certain way and things are scary. You know, I, 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 have you ever heard of the Tony Woody, NDE, yeah. Tony Woody? Uh-huh. Veteran. In, yeah, in his full length NED. I uh, actually I, heard him in person tell that at I School. Oh, did you? I, uh, I read. He's awesome. Uh, I love him. I watched, um, of course, I've watched a bunch of his stuff, but I also read, uh, read uh, a transcript because I, I like to read some of these. Um, uh, it helps um, solidify up here, but I read a transcript of his long version of his NED, and he talks about how afterwards he went to a pastor and basically got the door shut. And it broke my heart because I, 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 would, I would bet my home that the pastor didn't mean any ill will. I just think the pastor had no idea of how to handle it. And so his way of handling it was not to. And what I want to show Christians is, look, with everything in life, there's a way that we can view it from a biblical way. We, we just have to think it through. Or you why to, biblical? Why not through a compassionate heart? Absolutely. But with a compassionate for, heart. Yeah. I would say that those two are combined and you can't separate them because the, in the Bible, uh, unless Jesus was scolding the Pharisees, right? Everybody that Jesus had an encounter with, and most people that the disciples had an encounter with, particularly after the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts and beyond, um, their interactions were nothing but compassion. Um, and so I think those two are hard to separate. Uh, I think that Christians do a pretty good job of doing that, unfortunately, but they, they need to understand that when we think of these things biblically, that there are certain um, certain requirements that, that come with that. So not only am I, when I say think of something biblically, what I mean is that given that Christianity is true and given what God has revealed to us either in creation, in our conscience, or revealed to us in his word, given that, how should we think about it? And once we've kind of come to that conclusion, okay, does, you know, does creation say anything about this? Or does my conscience, uh, does the Holy Spirit speak to me in, in that way? Or does the Bible say anything about once we've come to that kind of conclusion, then now the next step has got nothing to do with um, our view of Bible. Our, our next step is completely pragmatic. Now, now how am I going to take Jesus to to these people in regards to this issue. That should be our step. And we seem to have these extremes um, where some Christians think that, uh, you know, they don't even want to hear anything like this. And, 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 uh, and then we have this other extreme where there's some Christians who are like, Oh, come on in. Anything's anything. We'll take anything. Um, and, and I'm like, wait, wait a second. There's some middle ground here. Um, uh, so the idea is, is that we want to present the truth in love. Those things cannot be separated. Uh, and when they are separated, then that's when we see a deviation, either in how we treat someone or how we interpret, um, you know, our experiences. And so if we, if we bring someone, if we bring them truth without love, they're not going to listen to us because they don't think we care. Yeah, you can't if, see clearly when you're rolling your eyes at someone right. or looking down your nose at them. Right. And if we bring um, and if we bring um, someone love, but no truth, then they're not going to listen to us or follow us anyhow, because it doesn't line up with reality. I mean, people are ultimately seeking what is uh, not necessarily what is true. Oftentimes in their worldview, they're seeking what they want you know, what, what is going to be the most fulfilling for me. Um, but ultimately people have a sense of they, they, they want truth. And so you could bring me something in love all day long, but if it's not true, 
and it can't be applied to my life in a in an everyday commonsensical way. I'm just I don't know how much of that I'm going to listen to. Like I'll be kind, but like I, how much of that am I going to ingest and then apply? And it wouldn't to my it be life? a shame if that person was telling the truth and give about a miracle that God did that God wanted that person to hear, and that person thought too much of their ego to be fooled by such a thing and they would totally miss what god mm. had sent for them here i know in the when i was first in the bright white light at 25 when i died my first thought before i seen anything or experienced anything was just in the bright white light and i thought it's real oh my gosh it's real the whole god bible jesus angels thing i haven't seen anything yet but i just like i was somewhere else i went through this tunnel and i before I even heard into ear tunnel, of course, it was 1986, but I, I was not in my body. This thing happened and I'm like, it's real. Like life after death is real. And I'm in this white light and I'm thinking, and I'm talking to God, which I can't see anybody at that moment, but I'm saying, God, you need to see, send people back. And t- so they can tell people it's real. I mean, the Bible's getting old. I know people like come out to me probably for saying that, but that's not what five, you know? I know what you mean. Yeah, I know it's what like, you the mean. The Bible's yeah. old. People are getting tired of reading it, you know? And we need something new and let people go back. Like just pick a few and let them go back and, and tell what they see here so they'll know it's true. And then, you know, have a whole, ex- whole experience. And, you know, people talk about, you know, the change after a near-death experience, but that change don't always come at once. It might be decades. Mm-hmm before right. it takes sometimes a long time to integrate to process because mm-hmm. it's wow how right. can that be true and everything in your fibers you know you know it was true but how do you verbalize that who do you tell who would believe it who would listen? and so you know especially back like in the 80s 90s you know before the internet and we had the right. word death experience people's like mum's the word you know right. we're not taboo. that crazy that we would actually tell yeah, anybody taboo right yeah that, that those this this is in line with like sex or politics or demon possession. Like the church just doesn't want to talk about it. And it's funny because like, okay, these are the things the church should be talking about. Um, particularly because, you know, when I'm going to talk to somebody about Jesus, I don't cold call, meaning like I usually just don't walk up to people and go like, Hey, you, do you love Jesus? Like <laughs> people are like, what do you, what's wrong with you? Right. So you got to have some tact, like the, the way, the best way to witness to somebody is, is doing so in normal conversation, but people just don't know how to bridge that gap. How do you go from talking about the weather or the Browns, the Cleveland Browns to, to, you know, to, to God or Jesus? Well, maybe if the Browns won the Super Bowl, I was that, in a that, hospice would, that would be evidence for God, but I was in a hospice meeting for my sister's disabled nursing home last week. And something just told me, bring up your NDE channel, you know, it's hospice, you know, and there's people around the table that's their family members in hospice. And, and they started talking about you know, services and things to offer. I thought, oh, maybe somebody benefit from, you know, watching these indie mm-hmm. points. And so I just said what I did and mentioned I had, had been on Dr. Oz and, and, and a couple of stories brief, you know, you, <laughs> I felt like I just did not belong there. Oh, I no. Quiet. It was bad. <laughs> Cold shoulder. They changed um, the subject. You know, and you know why people do that? You know why people do that? It's they don't know what to think of them. And um, I think that uh, as as the church, if we're able to equip people with um, obviously logical thinking skills and 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 give them some direction, don't tell them necessarily what to think, show them how to think correctly. And then um, giving them just giving them some direction on this. Um, I think is going to, so like, unfortunately for you and probably for me, the, the stuff that we're doing now, I think a lot of the benefits will be seen in the future, just like so the people in the seventies yeah. and the eighties, and they started in all this, you know, all the, the books started coming out and um, now we're benefiting. We are benefiting from that because now it's not quite as taboo. We can talk about it. Um, and I think that what's going to happen is that our um, ability to communicate this truth with the church and in a way of, of showing them, hey, this is something you have to be afraid of. It's just something you have to look through with a biblical worldview. And once you do that, then you'll have a better idea of how to handle it. And then it's 
always easy to handle it if you take Jesus's approach and you're just nice and you're kind. And with the internet now, there are never any answer, uh, questions, only answers. Like you, you can look up anything. So there's you. I tell people all the time, you may not have all the answers. That's fine. I don't either. But you should be able to know where to get the answers. Um, listen, 2000 years of some of the smartest people in human history have been Christians thinking about these tough issues. We have a, I mean, almost on any issue, you have an ocean's worth of ink spilled on that issue from a Christian perspective. So these answers or these questions have been answered. Um, it, it's just a question of um, being able to find those. And I've had a lot of people in my own church who have started uh, they, they've, they, they have started down that path. When I, when I first came, uh, they weren't much into the apologetics. And I don't want to say they looked at it negatively, but they definitely did look at it like kind of like, ah, uh, maybe unnecessary. Uh, but as it turns out, as the years go by, I get more and more. Hey, Pastor Jamie, so-and-so said that you know a thing or two about abortion. And I had this kid in school stand up and say this. What do you think? And so that person maybe didn't know how to answer them, but they knew where they could send the person to find the answers. And that's what we need to be as Christians. We need to be kind. We need to be affirming in terms of like, I might not believe this is true, but I believe you believe this is true. And I'm going to listen to you. And that's more important than. Yeah. And I'd rather have somebody ask intrusive and even rude questions than just ignore me. Right. And, and, and make up their mind. Right. And so, but it, it has to do with people just not knowing what to think of it. And so if we're able to help them think more clearly about it, I think that the church will reap the benefits just probably when we're long gone. But uh, I hope that, uh, I know that your channel obviously is making an impact. You're reaching people on, a lot of people on the fence, which is where we kind of need to be. And um uh, I'm not necessarily going to reach a dogmatic Christian. They're they're already in our camp, right? Uh, you drag out the bones of Jesus, and they're still going to be a Christian. Yeah. They still and, got and, their members. Know, I went into you this, know. you know, just more Christian into ease, and but yet I wanted to be fair to the New Agers too. I didn't want to be right. shut out like I was. I was shut out the Indian community because I was pro life, and I never want to you know, do that to anybody. Just I don't like your thoughts on things. I'm not going to no because I want to hear your experience, and I want to hear their experience and separate that from their personality mm -hmm. and their politics and their religion or right. life life because and, um, it is very separate because I watch people and they can tell me the most beautiful NDE. And then when they're done talking, they'll turn around and ruin it. <laughs> to me, it's ruining it by attaching all these new age right. uh, theories to it. Right. And and I know it's not their fault. That's what they've been exposed right. to. Because the exactly. NDE was seemed legit. Right. But, but they this is the mind. That was their spirit. Now this is their mind. They have right. That's how they've kind of interpreted the NDE, mm -hmm. right? That's how they've interpreted it. And I think it does come down to um, listen, I'm gonna, if anything, my wife will tell you that if anything, I'm gonna be fair. I mean, listen, if you find the bones of Jesus and you can show me that that's true, I'm out. I'm, I'm not I'm not a Christian anymore because. Uh, my faith rests on a historical event, namely the resurrection of Jesus. If that didn't happen, I'm out. Now, I still might be a theist. I, I, there are so many arguments for the existence of a higher power. There's just no way. I think that's insurmountable. I don't think the skeptic is able, it will ever even able. I've read, I've read the scholarly literature on these, on these arguments. I've read what they've had to say, and it's not that great. Right. Uh, so we have a mountain of evidence. So even if somehow Christianity was proven false, I, I would still have to believe in higher power because of that evidence. But my point is that I, I want to be open about, I want to be open-minded about it. I mean, uh, you know, that's why I have a podcast where my co-host is an atheist. I, I, I want to know what's true. If that's Christianity, great. If it's not, that's going to stink because my whole world is wrapped up in Christ. Everything I know in love is wrapped up in Christ. So it would be a, a death. It really would feel like a death if I found out or I came to believe that Christianity wasn't true. But I would rather live a, an uncomfortable truth than live uh, a, an uncomfortable. Uh, wait, I'd rather live an uncomfortable truth than live a comfortable lie. 
So I, I want to know what is true and I want to help other people um, develop the skills by which they can view things through a, a Christian lens, look at it with as little bias as they can interpret it through our core beliefs. Don't, don't, I think it's important that we discuss secondary and tertiary issues. I think there, I think that's important. Polemics is important. Uh, people debating whether or not speaking in tongues is biblical. That's important, but that's secondary. And I think we need to keep, as my pastor says, we need to keep the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. And as Christians, we need uh, to do that. We don't need to die on this hill where someone says they saw the force. Okay, you saw the force. I'm going to listen to your interpretation of that. And I'm going to try to be kind. And I'm going to try to speak what I know is true to the best of my ability in the most loving way. And then I'm going to let the Holy Spirit sort it out because it's not my job to convince. It's not, I mean, I want to convince that's the goal, but it's, that's not my job. My job is to lay out a case, an evidential case that you should be convinced by. And it's your job to be convinced by things that are convincing. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to ultimately do that and move people and put people in a place. But I also think that God is a respecter of freedom of the will. Right. And I, I think that, you know what, people often talk about God's hiddenness, that God's hidden. Like, where is he? If he, if he was here, like, why wouldn't he make himself more known? And I, I tell them this story about how we were looking for a washer and dryer. Our, our washer had broke years ago. And we're like, well, why don't we just get both a washer and a dryer? And it, every billboard I pass was for stinking washer. Every back when commercials, every commercial there was was for Maytag. And I'm like, this is insane. Are they, are, are they is this got this place bugged? Like, how do they know that? But, but it, what, what, what was happening was, is because my mind was open, my eyes were open to looking for that kind of thing. I found it everywhere. And I say that God, uh, Blaise Pascal, great Christian uh, theologian thinker, he said that God has given enough light, enough evidence for someone with an open heart and an open mind to see it everywhere. Yet he's kept himself um, cloaked or shrouded just enough so that people who have a contrary disposition or people who don't don't care to have a relationship with God, they can they can justify their non-belief because God just doesn't want people to believe that he exists. He wants a loving relationship with them. If he wants, listen, everybody at one point is going to believe God exists because it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So at some point, everybody will have the mental proposition knowledge that God exists, but that's not what God wants. God wants a loving relationship with us and you can't force people and to I believe him. he does that through these type experiences. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be near death experience. It can be a spiritual experience. It could right. be seeing your dead grandmother or there's all kinds of spiritual experiences that if people don't believe those things, they're going to have these experiences and brush it away and not talk about it. Maybe their church don't believe in it. All those kind of things that they're just going to and, and their gifts and their gifts that keep giving. I mean, if you have a spiritual experience and um, you finally realize it and verbalize it and it just makes you like glow, it brings light into your heart. It brings you more faith. It brings you closer to God. And if you're going to deny that, which I denied mine for a long time and that doesn't make sense. My life wasn't rich until I started opening up my eyes to accept God did this for me. It changed my life. And if I had stayed cold hearted and not opened up to that fact, I wouldn't be, you know, the person I am today, right. which I think is better than what, you know, I would have been, I would have probably been, you know, something completely uh, materialistic. Well, God takes us, he, he, he puts us, I think God is so knowledgeable that, that he knows under what circumstances, if we would be willing to come to know him, under what circumstances those would be. 
And then I think God has created a world in which um, if someone would come to Christ, then the uh, situation would lend itself to them coming to Christ. So if, if I needed to have a terrible car accident in order for me to come to know Christ, then, then he would have created a world in which that would have happened. So I think that anybody who has an open heart and an open mind, that, that before they die, if they do really genuinely have an open heart and an open mind, that God will reach out to them in a way that's understandable to them, in, in a way that they find um, that they find evidentially satisfactory. Yeah. And, you know, if the common goal is for Christians to be closer to God and others to be closer to God or to find God, these experiences right now, this time we have in the world with everything going on is giving people hope. And, you know, if they want to shut those out and say they're lying, not real, that's up to them. But for a lot of people, it's bringing them to maybe not to church, but it's bringing them to pray and it's bringing them to feel a relationship with God and start talking to God. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's something that opens the door. Yeah. And I think many Christians, I, I think what they're scared of, like we mentioned earlier, I think they're scared of just not knowing what, you know, how do, how do I, as a Christian, how do I think about these things? And then also too, I think that they're afraid that like if somebody has say a near death experience and, and they kind of um, uh, they're open up about it, that falling into the new age. Um, they have a right gonna, to be scared. They is, have a right it, to be is, leery. Like, like that's, that's not going to get them any closer to eternal life. According to a Christian, we believe that there's only one way to salvation and that's through the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. So uh, you might be closer to God, but you're, you're, you're not closer to the God. And mm -hmm. so they, they, a lot of Christians are fearful that if it goes that way, and that they it's should like, be. The, like, it's a like point of no return, you know, but, but I yeah. see it as kind of an open door. Like if I can get somebody who is a naturalist, an atheist who doesn't believe in God or the supernatural, whatever, if I can get them to start falling into, well, I know there's a higher power, Oh, like my job is 80% done. You know, like I'm licking my chops at that point because now I can present this mountain of evidence that we have as Christians and it, it that points true. to the Christian worldview. That the, it is true that the new age community, not all, a lot, sole purpose is to turn people away from Christianity, away from church, and to make them believe in reincarnation, a pre-birth plan, we all get to go to heaven no matter what you do. Right. And even today, I've heard it before, and even someone said it on my Facebook today. It's still on there. They believe that abortion is okay because we all die and we don't die. You know, there's the soul never dies, so there's nothing wrong with it. And I'm thinking, well, I don't see you signing up for that. Right. And, and yeah, right. So, so would it be okay if I come to your house and slit your throat? Right. I mean, well, like, your you're going to live anyhow, right? Well, you're alive, why not, right? Well, listen, you're, you're going to live anyhow, right? Your soul's not going to die. Maybe you're going to go to a better place now. I mean, th listen, the thing is, is they, they a lot of people who are pro-choice think with, they think they're thinking with their heart. Uh, I, I, I try to be as charitable as I can that, that they're, they, they really do believe that somehow women's rights are being violated. Um, but oftentimes I find they're just not thinking with their mind. And as I lay out a case, it's funny because they'll bring up a point, And as that point is refuted, instead of saying, oh, yeah, that's a good point. They just move to another point and then that will be refuted. You know, they'll start right. with, oh, but it's just small. And then once I refute that, they're like, oh, but it's it's not it's it's not far along. It's you know, there's uh, you know, they're, they're not as far along. Uh, they're not as developed. And then I'll refute that. And then they'll be like, well, but it's in the mother. And then I'll refute that. And they'll be like, but it's dependent on the mother. And then like so it's just like. They have this end goal in mind, and it doesn't matter where the evidence is going to go. Like at the end of the day, that's where they're going to be. And sometimes I decide that um, those conversations aren't the ones I should have. That that um, my time is more productive somewhere else. You know, um, because and, they're not going to listen. They're not right. going to change. I, I try to be very, and I think that's where my uh, being Pentecostal comes uh, in handy because I, I rely heavily upon the Holy Spirit. In may having these conversations, if I feel like, okay, yeah, I, I just something not right about this, um, you know, as it says in the Bible, I'll, I'll kick off, uh, 
kick the dust off my sandals and move to the next town. You know, I'll move on to someone who's at least willing to hear me out. And so that's also um, uh, important is that, that um, you know, as we're going through that we're able to um, utilize the Holy Spirit as our, our, our compass in directing us through day-to-day life. Finally, I just go right for the throat after, you know, they won't listen to anything reason. I'll go right for the throat and say, okay, how many abortions have you had? If you're so proud of it, if you're so for it, then you should not be ashamed to tell everybody right here, how many abortions have you had? Well, they don't want to do that. Well, why not? If you're so for it and you're so, you know, advocating this, then why would you be ashamed? Right. Often the, often the pro uh, abortion language is cloaked in language that makes it less horrific uh there it's a clump of cells or it's a fetus it's like yeah it's a fetus so were you uh, yeah yeah as it's a fetus as as much as i'm an adult male if that's just uh that's just a uh, a part of our development uh what's your point like so but they'll cloak that language um in a way that seems less horrific. And I, and I think it does boil down to what do you think is in the womb? If it is an innocent human being, then you can do nothing with it, but allow it to live uh, and help it. If it is not, you can do whatever you want with it. None of my business. But I think through biology, um, we can show that, that what is in the womb is an organism. It is um, living and that it's human. It comes from two human parents, can't be anything else. So it's a, it's a living human being. And then often they'll try to attach personhood. Well, but it's not a person yet. Okay. Let's see whose standard is more arbitrary. I say you're a person if you're a member of the human species. When is someone a person according to you? And no matter what they say, it's going to be completely arbitrary and coming in varying degrees. They'll say, oh, um, consciousness. Okay, so can I go to the second floor down here at Doctors West Hospital and stab people to death who are in a coma? No, why? They're unconscious. They don't have consciousness. Okay, uh, they'll say something like, well, um, development, when they're viable. Well, I got a 12-year-old kid right now that's more dependent upon me than uh, they were in, in my wife's womb. So dependence has got nothing to do with it. Just because someone is dependent on something doesn't make them less valuable. Again, can I go to Doctors West Hospital and start pulling the plug on these machines? People are 100%, 100% um, dependent upon these machines to keep them alive. But that doesn't mean we could kill them because they're dependent on it. It's just a money-making scheme. Yeah, I think think that it's got a lot of issues. But we obviously... Um, um, today we had a, a ruling, didn't we, in yeah. the um, pro-life community. And so I think the only time this will really end, because obviously this gets kicked back to the states now, the only way this will really end is if we get a constitutional amendment, basically the, what we did with slavery, stating that the unborn from time of either conception, fertilization, implantation, whatever verbiage you want to use, uh, from that point on, they are members of uh, the human species. They ha- contain personhood and they contain all the rights that you and I have. Yep. Once we see that kind of amendment, then, then we'll be able to outlaw it like we have slavery. Um, yep. But until then, we'll continue the good fight. And our Ohio governor is pushing through the heartbeat bill today. That's right. Something's better than nothing. So we'll take it. Yeah. And they bring up rape all the time. I say, like, yeah, what about rape? Because there's no such thing as raping the abortion clinic because the nurses and doctors, they're all mandated reporters. But in an abortion clinic, they don't report rape. They could come in again and again, and this child has been raped again by her father or whoever, and they don't report anything. They care more about well, making the money and keeping it going. Yeah, it doesn't. And with the whole rape thing, um, first of all, I point out that it, it's such a small percentage, right? right. Less than 1%. 1%. But let's let's just say I'll just grant you that for the sake of it. Let's say it's it's more than that. But the point with rape is that um, okay, so a woman got raped. Would we give the man who raped her the death penalty? Most people would say no. Most people say no. Throw him in jail. Lock you know. Throw him. Throw away the key. Lock him up. 
but most people wouldn't even give the rapist the death penalty. And then I go, okay, well, will you give the mother the death penalty? They're like, what are you talking about? She hasn't done anything. And I say, okay, well, then why are we giving this child a harsher punishment than the rapist? That seems insane to me. And tell me about a death penalty that rips their arms and legs off and stabs them in the head while they're alive. Right. And um, it doesn't, that's really a moot point, to be honest with you. I hate to say it because I I don't want to sound callous. I I know people who have been raped and have had a baby, a product of rape. So I'm not belittling it when I say this, but it's a moot point. It doesn't matter if you're raped. Uh, It just doesn't because my child, if I was, it's, it's an innocent human being. And if someone uh, that would be like, you know, if someone came in and raped my wife, do I have the right to go kill my next door neighbor? No, I, I don't. I am not granted the right to take away innocent life. It doesn't matter what it is the product and, and of. It say, doesn't matter. And they say it's not human. Well, that's what Hitler said about Jews. You know, they didn't have any trouble killing them because they weren't human. I said, I guarantee you, Hitler wouldn't even killed his own children, though. Right. Well, here's the thing, though. I could biologically, through through biology, through embryology, prove to you that it's a human being. There isn't any. Um, biologist or embryologist who would say that what is in the womb isn't human. Uh, and then, of course, then they'll say, well, what I mean is they're not a person yet. Okay, well, tell me what constitutes a person. Because in my book, if you're human, you're a person. Anything you pick, anything at all, is going to be completely arbitrary. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to celebrate at this point, like all their excuses and all That's their right. too bad because it just got overturned. Almost 50 years. That's right. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to have some celebration. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. And a great day to be talking to you today. Yeah. Terrific. um, I'll talk to you Sunday. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you very much for having me. I had a, that's a great conversation. Thank you. All right.